I think the most dedicated fans in all of sports has to be Vikings fans. Okay? Here's why. You know how many Super Bowl rings the Vikings have? <laughs> right? When, 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 when they do studies, and, and there are people who do studies of this sort of thing, the sports region that has the most region, or the most reason to lament is Minnesota, Minnesota sports fans. It is. I mean, the Vikings are 0-4 in the Super Bowl. The Twins, thankfully, they've won a couple World Series, right? But we've lost a hockey team. We finally gained a hockey team, and boy, look at them now. If you're following the Minnesota Wild, they are, they are lightning hot. They are just on fire. Hopefully, they'll be able to keep this through the Stanley Cup. But it's Minnesota sports, so we kind of have that mentality where you just don't get your expectations up that high, do you, right? It's like, if I put too much hope in this, they're going to bite me, right? It's like that dog, you're, you're, you kind of want to pet the dog, but you know it's going to growl at you. So, you. so you're a little gun shy to put too much faith in the Vikings or the Twins or, or the Wild or even the Golden Gophers. When was the last time... Uh, it was a long time since they've been really a strong program. And so it's, we kind of like to suffer for some reason in Minnesota, I guess, is, is, is all that I'm saying. And, but the truth of the matter is, if you're a Vikings fan, and you've been a Vikings fan for a long time, nobody can argue the fact that you're a fair weather fan, right? Because you've stuck with them through thick and, and mostly thin. You've, you, you've stuck with the Vikings fan. And where, where does this come into a sermon? Where is that relevant? Well, we're going to be talking about Job today, and it's going to be, I think, a very relevant illustration that we stick with it. Um, one pastor once said this, said, so many people's religion is a fair weather affair. A little rain, and it ruins it. It crumbles. A touch of strain, and their faith snaps. But if we turn away from our faith in times of trouble, what will we turn to? Haven't we already at that point lost enough that losing our faith on top of it is, is more than we should really have to handle? Today we are, as I said, going to spend some time in the book of Job. Um, that's not the only place that we could begin, but it makes sense to start in the book of Job because Job deals with the timeless question of suffering and loss. Even though the story is about uh, roughly 4,000 years old, uh, believed to be probably the oldest story in the Bible, other than obviously in the beginning God created, that kind of comes first. But as far as the books of the Bible, Job is probably the oldest. Even though it's very old, when you read it, it feels almost as if you, it could have been written yesterday, right? Uh, the book is full of all sorts of mysteries. You know, who wrote it, when, where, why. We don't have the absolute knowledge in each and every one of those categories. But the greatest mystery in the book of Job itself is actually uh, the subject matter itself. The mystery of undeserved suffering, right? Why do bad things happen to good people, right? For centuries, thoughtful people have pondered that question. Why do babies die? Why are innocent people held hostage by madmen? Why are the righteous passed over for promotion while the cheaters and the scandals go on to win Super Bowls in New England? I mean, never mind. Um, uh, prosper. That's a joke about the New England Patriots, if you didn't know. The book doesn't answer those sorts of questions, actually, with a theory. Instead, the book of Job answers our questions with a story. We are invited in on a journey in the book of Job to examine the life of one man whose life just crashes all around him. And why did that happen to him? And, and what did he do about it? The book of Job is, is a, a very direct, very simple book to begin with. It, it kind of unfolds like a, almost like a movie, like a film, right? That's going at, at super speed. When, when you read the beginning of Job, stuff comes so quickly. The frames just go zipping by as his entire life is squeezed into just a, a few short handful of sentences. Now, in those very first five verses of Job, uh, they tell us three important things about Job. 
And the first thing we learn about Job as we're following along in Job, and you're welcome to grab a Bible or open up your iPhones or iPads or Androids or whatever you got. Um, I'm going to be in Job 1 this whole time, so you'll be able to follow along and you'll see it on the screen. We see three things in these first five verses, though. And, and the first one I want you to notice is that, that the Bible tells us that Job was a righteous man. It says, in the land of Uz, beautiful name for a land, right? In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright, and he feared God, and he shunned evil. Job 1.1. 1, 1. And you could talk for hours, folks, on, on just those phrases there. Job was blameless. Job was upright. Job feared God and he shunned evil. We could go on and on and on about that. A lot of good sermons just there. But suffice it to say that, that Job was as good of a man as you will find in all of the Bible. Job was a very, very good man. And then another thing we see in this passage, we're told that not only was he a good man, but Job was a rich man, right? It says he had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys, and a large number of servants. It says that he was the greatest man among all of the people of the East, in verses 2 and 3. Now, it's hard to know exactly how to translate this into the modern term, but, you know, you think of guys like Warren Buffett, right? Or you think of Bill Gates and, and, and these people who are rich beyond imagination, who have more money than is even humanly possible to spend. That is the level of wealth we're talking about with Job. 3,000 camels. I mean, I, I can't even imagine 30 camels, let alone 3,000 camels. But this dude has tons of livestock, this is, of course, back before the day and age of banks as we know it today. And the place that you invested your money to multiply your money, because you couldn't get a CD, you couldn't get a money market account, you couldn't take it and put it in an IRA or a Roth or you know, any of those kinds of things, right? You put your money in your animals and your land. Because animals, well, they do what animals do and they grow. And your wealth increases, right? Right? So Job is basically filthy, stinking rich. He is probably the richest man in the world at this time. Certainly, it says, the richest man in the East. And by spelling out all these details, the, the sheep and the oxen and the camels, camels and the donkeys, our text is telling us that, that if there was a list of the richest people in the world, he had to be right there at the top. Interesting. So he was righteous. He was rich. And then the third thing it tells us, it says that he was a religious man as well. It says these words. His sons used to take turns holding festival in their homes. And they would invite their three sisters to come eat and drink with them. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would then send and have them purified. And early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, well, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. Verses 4 and 5, right? Here we see the rarest of all rare creatures. A truly wealthy man who loves God more than he loves his money. And not only that, but a, a father who, who takes responsibility for the spiritual welfare of his own family. And the point of these first few verses is this, and it's very clear. By the world's standards, Job was incredibly successful. By God's standards, Job was righteous. Here is a man who truly had it all. He was wealthy. He was godly. He was popular. You couldn't find a person to say a bad thing about the guy, right? As I said earlier, this is as good of a man as you're going to find in the Bible. Job loved God more than he loves his money. That fact is absolutely crucial to understanding his story. And let me say it carefully here. What happened to Job happened to him because he was a good man. Nothing in the book of Job makes sense unless that fact is true. 
Job is a case study in suffering of the righteous. And as hard as it it may be for us to understand, it was actually Job's righteousness and Job's prosperity that, that brought on these enormous calamities and sufferings that we're going to hear about in a moment that he experiences. And yet, as he experiences them, the suffering he goes through was undeserved in the truest sense of the word. And so while you, you, you ponder that, consider what happens next in this story. The story suddenly shifts from kind of the earthly realm, from, from Job's first test. It, it, it jumps into heaven. And, and as we read the story of Job, and I would encourage you maybe this week, go home and read this first chapter again. As, as we read through this and as we study this, keep in mind, Job apparently never knew about this part of the story himself. While he was on earth tending these vast holdings that he'd been blessed with, Satan's up in heaven having a conversation with God. It says, one day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord from roaming the earth, going back and forth in it. Now, just a quick side note, I don't think God is saying where did you come from? Because he doesn't know. I think he's asking that question so we, the readers, so we, the hearers, generations later, can understand something important. Because th- this passage answers a prevailing misconception about Satan. If you ask the average person, where is Satan today? Most people are going to go, oh yeah, he's in hell, right? But the Bible doesn't teach that. Satan's not in hell. If Satan were in hell today, we wouldn't have any problems at all. In this age, in this time, the earth is under his power and his dominion. Thank God the day will come where Satan and all of his hordes will be cast into a lake of fire. Matthew 25, Revelation 20 tells us that. But that won't happen until Jesus returns to the earth. Between now and then, we're told in Scripture, 1 Peter 5, 8, that, that Satan roams around on the earth roaring like a lion, right? Seeking men and women that he can devour. So when God says, Satan, where'd you come from? It's not like he's surprised that Satan just showed up all of a sudden. I mean, he's God. God knew where Satan was coming from. He's just telling us, so we know. Now I say all that to make the point that, that that Satan was behind what was going on down on earth to Job. See, Job never knew that. And God never bothers to tell Job why this happens. But the writer of the book of Job kind of gives us a, a peek behind the curtain of heaven so that we might see this unfolding drama between God and Satan. And that brings us to the key passage of the story in in verse 8. Notice in verse 8 that it's God who brings up Job's name. God and Satan are talking, talking about how things go on earth. God says to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth who is like him. So that's kind of the other side of the coin. Satan was behind Job's trials, but God was behind Satan. It's not Satan who even brings Job up in the story, right? It's God. It's as if God was saying, all right, Satan, if you're looking for a good man, let me tell you about Job. He's the best man I've got. I don't think you can break him down. I don't think you can take him out. And what an insight that is for us. Satan was behind Job's trials, but God was still there behind Satan. Behind the suffering is Satan, but yet beyond that and behind that, God is still there. And that's why as we read the book of Job, you can find, as you read the book of Job, Job complaining to God, right? But you'll never find Job complaining about Satan. Even though Satan was the one who caused this calamity, He was only able to do so with God's permission. If God had not given permission to Satan, Satan couldn't have done a thing to Job, couldn't have touched a hair on his head. 
In verse 9, we come to the key question of the book. And it says this. Does Job fear God for nothing? See, as you read the story of Job, Satan comes to God and he accuses God of basically bribing Job into worshiping him. I mean, because after all, think about it. Job had it all. Job had huge land holdings, a a large loving family, enormous worldly wealth, great success in everything that he did. No wonder he worships God, right? He's got it all. Life is grand. Life is easy. He's got servants to take care of his flocks. He wakes up in the morning, walks out on the porch, looks over his holdings, then does whatever he wants the rest of the day because he's got it made. I mean, who wouldn't worship God if that was life, right? And that's what Satan's accusing him of. That's what Satan means in verse 10 when he says, God, haven't you kind of put a hedge around Job? Haven't you kind of given him some extra protection so nothing could harm him? God, isn't Job living on easy street, Satan is saying? Because he doesn't appear to have a worry in the world. Of course he's your best man, God. He's also your richest man. He's also your most successful man. You can kind of see Satan going, you kind of take care of your own, don't you, God? Right? Kind of goading God on. And behind it all is the not-so-subtle message that Satan is accusing God of basically bribing Job with prosperity. God, you've been dangling these riches like a carrot in front of him, so of course he follows you. He wants those carrots. Satan's accusing God of rigging the system, so to speak. As if there was some sort of contract between God and Job that went like this. Job says, I'll be good as long as you bless me. Right? That's the agreement. That's the way it's going to work. I'll be a pious man. I'll be religious. I'll be righteous. As long as you pour down upon me prosperity. And this is the Old Testament version of what we see sometimes in some aberrant theology in the American church and other places in the world of prosperity theology. That if I'm just good enough, of course I'm going to be blessed, right? Of course. Because that's the way it has to work. As if I could somehow manipulate God into blessing me. But that theology comes from Satan, not from God. Satan is attacking Job's motive and God's integrity in the story. And, and here's the real question of the book of Job. Will anyone serve God for no personal gain? If there's nothing in it for me, will I still serve God anyhow? Satan says no. Satan says, Job will only worship you, God, when things are going his way. Thus, he says in verse 11, he says to God, Satan says this to God, he says, God, stretch out your hand and strike everything that he has. And surely then, God, then Job is going to curse you to your face. You see, Satan's question is this supreme question of all of life. You served God in the sunshine, but will you serve him in the rain, right? You believed in him in the light of day, but now in the dark of the night, where are you at? You sang his praises when everything was going well. Will you still sing when the tears come? You came to church and you declared, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But how were you as you walked through the valley of the shadow of death? I mean, he was good enough for you when you had money, when you had the large bank account, right? But is he good enough for you then when it's all gone and you're broke? God was good enough for you when you were healthy. But what happens when the doctor comes and says, you've only got six months to live? He was good enough for you when you were married. What happens when the spouse walks out? He was good enough when your kids were obedient and listening to you. But then what happens when they go astray? He was good enough. But then when life happens, then when calamity comes, then when disaster strikes, 
How's it going to be? See, it's not hard to believe in God when things are going our way, is it? Anyone can do that. That's what Satan is saying. But what happens when life happens? Now, at this point in the book of Job, the scene shifts again from heaven back down to earth. Satan has received God's permission to put Job to the test. We get to verse 13 and notice what happens. It says, On a day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house. It says, In this moment, in this moment of celebration as a family, it's like a family reunion, it's like a party, it's a good time, right? And they're not being condemned for having this party, folks. Don't read that into it. They're celebrating. They're rejoicing. They're having a good time. And in this moment of happiness, when you would least expect it, when everything seems to be perfect in the world, bam, then Satan strikes. Listen to this. So first the Sabaeans, they come and they steal Job's livestock, right? They come and take away a, a bunch of his worldly wealth. And then they kill his servants, verses 14 and 15. Second, a fire of God destroy his sheep and kill his other servants. Verse 16, right? Third, the Chaldeans come and they steal his camels and kill some more of his servants. Fourth, a great wind happens. It comes and it blows against the house where his children, all ten of them, are partying and having a good time. And the walls and the roof collapse and they're all dead. Oh. Talk about a bad day. Oh. And not only that, the way it comes, right? Job Job is sitting there, and and the first first messenger of misfortune comes running up. Job, 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 I got to tell you something. And he starts breaking the bad news to Job. And while that guy is telling him the bad news, the next guy runs up and says, hold on a second, got to tell Job something. Something really bad happened just a moment ago and, and Job needs to know. And the first guy's going, I know, I'm already telling him. No, no, this is something different than what you're telling him, right? And the second guy's like running up while the first guy's telling him. And then the second guy's trying to tell him what happened. And then the third guy comes running up. I mean, this is bam, 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 bam. Bad news on top of bad news. Bang, bang, bang. And then, In the space of just a matter of minutes, Job loses everything that is dear to him in the whole world. His vast wealth vanished. His empire crumbled. His workers murdered. His children killed. That's the worst of it. When tragedy strikes, it, it sometimes feels like when bad things happen in our life, they begin to compound and pile up on us, right? It's like, like just the, the tidal wave, just this bam, wave after wave hitting us of, of problems and calamity and destruction and frustration in life. And we, we begin to think, oh, this has got to be the worst thing. And then boom, something else hits us in life, right? And then comes the next knock at the door. Just when it seems that things can't get any worse, the bottom falls out again. Job lost it not like in a year. He didn't lose it in six months. He didn't lose it in weeks. He lost everything in minutes, in a single afternoon. You can be on top of the world, folks, and lose it all in an instant. Tragedy can come again and again, and there's nothing, nothing we can do to stop it. Now, the only thing that that is left for us to see, then, is Job's response to this. Verse 20 says this, At this, hearing, hearing of this horrible, terrible, rotten, no good news, it says that, that Job got up and he, and he tore his robe and he shaved his head. Well, that sounds a little weird to us, but culturally, these are the actions of a man who's been torn apart in his heart. These are, are public symbols of, of just absolute pain and brokenness. This is the equivalent of wearing black to a funeral. 
And I, and I believe some of us have probably experienced things like this. Some of us have known this heartache and pain in our lives. Some of us have had these calamities come where you just think, man, how am I going to endure? How am I going to make it through this? Lord, let up. I don't think I can take any more. But here's the thing. Have you ever been there? Or maybe you're there now? I don't know. Jesus knows what we go through because he's been here with us before. He knows what it's to die of a broken heart, right? He's walked this road before. He knows and he understands. Our God is not a distant, absent, abstract, unknowing, and uncaring God, but is in fact come to the earth and walked the earth and experienced all the pain and all the tragedy far more than we ever will, in fact. He knows. A couple of things to to catch in this story here, in Job's response. Look at verse 20. So all of this happens. He loses everything. He tears his clothes. He shaves his head. And then what does he do? Then he falls to his knees in worship. Right? Here is the ultimate response of a man of faith. In the face of absolute, tremendous tragedy, unexplainable chaos, he weeps and he worships. And this is what differentiates Christians from the rest of the world. They weep and we weep. They get angry and we go to worship. Our sorrow is just as real as theirs is, but their sorrow leads to despair. Whereas ours, as Christ followers, leads to worship. Then look at verse 21. Verse 21 records Job's great statement of faith. He says three things. He says, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. Literally, this is true, right? We have a phrase for that. We call a naked person somebody in their birthday suit, right? That's the way we were born. But it's just as true at the end of our life as well. Because... We know this. We're not taking anything with us, are we? You ever heard that conversation at the funeral? Like, well, how much did he leave his wife? Everything. Right? He didn't take it with him. He left it all. No matter how much we've been given in this life, we can't keep it. In the end, as... John Ortberg says, it all goes back in the box. The Lord has given. The Lord giveth and he taketh away, right? The KJV. This is the man of faith speaking. And this statement, it just it, it rises above. It's so true that we will leave it all behind. But the man of faith understands this, that along the way, even though we had it, we never really actually owned it in the first place. All of it was given to us by God. All of it. And if all of it was given to us by God, then rightfully it's His and He can take it back anytime He wants. Because He is God. He doesn't have to ask our permission to do so. And He doesn't have to explain Himself to us afterwards. Then Job says, May the name of the Lord be praised. Right? This is Job's faith at at its pinnacle. Job's faith faith at its highest level. Job has lost it all. His wealth, his workers, his children. All that he counted dear in life has been ripped from his grasp. Yet, in the middle of that pain, 
Job praises God. And here's the great point. Job draws his argument for praise from the bitterness and his suffering. It's actually his loss that drives him back to the goodness of God. Every pain that he experiences is a reminder of how good God has been to him before that. The greater the sorrow, the greater the joy. Every tear for Job is a, is a way of saying, thank you, Lord, for what you gave me. In Job's case, the, the more that he grieves, the more then he blesses the name of the Lord. And our text ends with these amazing words in verse 22. It says, in the midst of all of this that had happened, all of this that had gone on, all of this that he'd experienced, in the middle of that, Job did not sin by charging God with any wrongdoing. He didn't ask God why. He didn't accuse God of not loving him. He didn't claim it was his right to have those things. He didn't curse God. He didn't give up on the faith. Job simply simply says to himself, If God takes something away from me, I'm going to thank him for letting me have it for a little while. And as I think about this story, it's a remarkable story. Uh, A few conclusions come to mind from it. The first is simply this. Undeserved suffering often comes to righteous men and women. Obviously, I mean, I think this is an obvious lesson from the story. And although we might have heard this before, I think we need to be reminded of this part of the story again. Three times in the text it emphasizes that Job was a righteous man. What happened to him wasn't because of any moral fault, wasn't because of some hidden sin in his life. And this is important for us to understand because we have this human tendency to think, Oh, if only I had lived a better life. If only I had given more, done more, served more, loved more, then this wouldn't have happened, right? And sometimes, indeed, that is true. But more often than not, it's not. If the story of Job teaches us anything, it's that sometimes godly people suffer terrible things, unexplainable losses. Bad things do happen to good people. So it's important for us to understand that. Life isn't always going to be easy. It's not always going to be roses. The second thing for us to get out of this, and I think this is another huge point that Job makes, is that God is the source and God is the owner of all that we have. And if that is true, and it is, then he has the right to take back anything at any time. Your house, it's his. Your job, it's his. Your future, your retirement, your kids, they're all his. They belong to him before they ever belong to you. Whatever you have was God's to begin with. All that you have belongs to God. And in the end, you will give it all back to Him whether you want to or not. And sometimes in this life, He will take back something that you would prefer to keep for yourself. But that is God's absolute right. For He is God. And He is good. All that we have belongs to God. And the third and final point that I want to close with is this. The trials that the faithful experience, the trials that we experience in this life are designed to help us draw near to God. The one great biblical purpose for trials in our lives is to help us draw nearer to our Creator God. Of course, we want to ask, why is this happening to me, right? Right? We want to know the answer to those questions. But the deeper question is, now that this has happened, will I remain loyal to God? When life comes crashing down, and when everything that we value is taken from us, if we give up our faith then, where will we go? 
if we're only faithful when life is good and we don't hold on to faith when life goes bad, what sort of faith did we have to begin with? If we turn away from God when things aren't going our way, we lose the only source we have for hope. The Apostle Paul puts it this way at the end of Romans 8. Paul writes this. He says, What can separate us from the love of God? What is the answer to that? Nothing. Nothing at all. Not life, Paul says. Not death. Not tragedy. Not heartbreak. Not suffering. We are forever connected to His love. And when we choose to trust God, and when we choose to put our hope in God, when we choose to love God when things aren't going our way, it strengthens that bond we have to God. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is Jesus Christ our Lord. Nothing. So the question remains, when life happens, what then? Through our tears, my hope is you will rest in confidence than the one who gave it to begin with. The one who has brought you this far will see you through to the end. The Bible says he won't abandon nor forsaken us. So when life happens, when trials come, turn to the cross. Turn to Jesus and lean more heavily upon him. Amen. Let's pray.